Hey, Tim, I want to ask you a question. Sure. What's on your mind? So I wanted to ask you what was on your mind when we named our podcast behavioral groups. Okay. Well, we've talked about this a bunch, so I'm assuming that mm -hmm. you've got somewhere to go with this. Uh, and I'll, I'll, <laughs> but I'll, I'll play along. I'll play along. All right. All right. I recall an immediate and positive reaction to the name behavioral groups. Because okay. like we were brainstorming and it just it just seemed right. We hit behavioral grooves. It's like, ah, man, it fits. I loved it. And I thought it'd just be a perfect name to sort of combine this love for behavioral science with the love for music. And we could combine the two. That, yeah. That's kind of so, what I thought. So if I hear you correctly, you were thinking that the name was a behavioral science plus music thing. Yeah. Yeah, of course. Right. Why wouldn't and, it be? It's behavioral groups. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and you also thought that I thought that it was a music plus <laughs> behavioral science thing, right? <laughs> oh, okay. I see where you're headed with this. I thought that the grooves part was about music and you thought that the grooves part was about something else. Yeah, I thought I thought grooves referred to the grooves in our brains when you have habits and routines and all of that kind of fun stuff. It's like, yeah, the our behavior grooves, okay. you know. Okay, so the the point here is, at least at that point in time, that we didn't clarify what grooves actually meant, right? Yeah, yeah. we both. Obviously, we both loved the name. It was one of those pieces. I did feel that immediate love, like you you said. But we didn't ask each other what we thought the names meant, right? So Yeah, yeah. I, I, we really missed a huge opportunity just to ask each other to find out what we thought each other meant in groups. Yeah. You know, and so, of course, now, right, as listeners know, we're both happy, super happy with the name. And we still laugh when we tell the story yeah. about how we didn't ask about the name. But at the time the stakes weren't that high that could have been higher and in some cases when you're agreeing to something and the stakes are definitely higher anyway it's really important that you need to ask and asking is really important if you want to know what is on the other person's mind just ask otherwise you start a podcast and all of a sudden your co-host <laughs> starts asking music questions out of the blue and you're caught totally off guard uh, okay so with that kurt i just want to ask you a question are you ready to start this episode? <laughs> yes. Welcome to Behavioral Grooves, the podcast that explores our human condition. I'm Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We talk with researchers and other interesting people to unlock the mysteries of our behavior by using this behavioral science lens. Yeah, and a musical component, too. Of In course. this episode, we get to talk to the author of a wonderful new book on successful communication called Ask. Tap into the hidden wisdom of people around you for unexpected breakthroughs in leadership and life. It's written by Jeff Wetzler, who is co-CEO of Transcend, a nationally recognized innovation organization, and he's an expert in learning and human potential. Jeff has more than 25 years in business and education as a management consultant to the world's top corporations, a learning facilitator for leaders around the world, and as chief learning officer at Teach for America. And Jeff is not your average practitioner. He earned a doctorate in adult learning and leadership from Columbia University and a bachelor's in psychology from Brown. Now, he's also written for Harvard Business Review, he's kind of a non-average guy in many ways. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. You know, it always puts us to shame. But there we go. All right. We wanted to talk to Jeff about his book and about communication in general. And there's a lot of behavioral science that focuses on communication. And for good reason, the words we use, the messenger who communicates them, the context in which we hear or experience the message and the medium are all terribly important to how we interpret anybody's message. In addition to what we take away from a message, all of those things also contribute to how we behave, right? Our actions and inactions are highly dependent on a lot of little variables. Jeff's book, Ask, delves into some ways we can improve our communication in the corporate world as well as in our personal relationships. Yeah, and we talked with Jeff about the importance of doing this one simple thing. When in doubt, ask. And I think our story of what we thought about the behavioral group's name and the misunderstanding that we had of each other's <laughs> yeah. understanding of that is an important example to keep in mind. 
We also talked about the importance of curiosity, a throwback to one of our favorite conversations uh, that we've ever had on Behavioral Grooves. That was one with Kwame Christian in episode 178 on what he called compassionate curiosity. Kwame's framing comes up very regularly in our lives, doesn't it, Tim? It sure does, Kurt, just yeah. constantly. <laughs> so so with, uh, with that, Groovers, we hope you sit back and relax with a two-finger pour of Curiosity on the Rocks and enjoy our conversation with Jeff Wetzler. Jeff Wetzler, welcome to Behavioral Grooves. It's great to be with you both. We're happy to have you here, and we need to know, we got to know right away, coffee or tea? Tea. Tea? I, believe it or not, I have never had a full cup of coffee in my entire life. Oh, but but you've consumed. You have. The, the, the smallest amount. I, I There's actually a small story behind it. I, I grew up in a household that just always drank tea. My parents never drank coffee, and so I never started drinking coffee. I then had a roommate in college who was so addicted to coffee that he couldn't fall asleep at night to the point where he had to take sleeping pills at night and then extra coffee in the morning to get to get him going and then more sleeping pills. And the poor guy had a total nervous breakdown. And I watched that and I said to myself, well, if this is what happens when you drink coffee, <laughs> this is not for me. Right, and, I, you know, it's right. probably not rational, but I just I just stayed away. Oh, after my gosh. That. Well, Tim, have you Tim, you've had a sip of coffee, haven't you? No, never even. A well, oh, really? Well, I mean, I've. I, I don't know. I don't think I have. Wow. I'm, I'm, I'm not 100%. I'm 99.5% okay. certain on that. But but you get coffee, for, you know, coffee is in, um, you know, I, like there's coffee ice cream and did that, I mention that's coffee not ice coffee, cream? coffee, though. You know, just no, you, but I, it's like, ugh, that flavor. Like, ugh. I, just, I do love the smell of it, though. Oh, yeah. Me too. Me too. Including coffee, ice cream. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Next time we're together, Tim, I'm going to make you take a sip. Oh, no. Yes, you are that. going to have to in oh. in, 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 ingest actual coffee because, you know. Okay. All right. All right. Jeff, sorry. This is supposed to be speed round. We have <laughs> just totally blew the speed round. Uh, or a minute and a half on there we go. coffee. There we go. Yeah. Okay. We have to get to the next question here. Cookies and milk or pie? I would have to say cookies and milk. <laughs> Good call. Good call. By the way, we're, we're, we're all on the same page there, I think. Is that right? Yeah. You, Whoa, it, it's, really? it's, it's a dependent kind of thing. I mean, a good piece of pie <laughs> with some ice cream on it. I mean, oh, I'm... you didn't mention the ice cream. Part. <laughs> no, 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 there is That's no a new other equation way now. to have pie. I just, you know, That's true. Yeah. So you're just implying that there will always be ice cream with pie. Yeah. <laughs> you know, whipped cream, ice cream, you know, some sort of cream that, you know, anyway. Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. All right. Jeff, is there such a thing as a bad question? I believe there are higher quality questions and what I would call crummy questions. Right. So <laughs> if you're really trying to learn, there's nothing that's a bad question, but questions can be used for lots of things that are not for learning. And I would say, that's not a good question. Yeah. Yeah. All the questions that Tim asked are those more crummy type questions. And then, <laughs> you know, yeah. no, we will talk about that more. So we want to get into, into what makes a, a, a better question as we talk about it. Last speed round question. Should we, is it better just to use our spidey skills to figure out what a person is thinking? Or should we maybe ask them what they're thinking? What, what, what's the better let, way? Let me think about that one for a second. <laughs> <laughs> I would say if you really want to know, you better ask. <laughs> I, and I was going on my Spidey skills, I guess, you know, that's the problem. There you go. Okay, so we are talking with Jeff about his new book, Ask, Tap Into the Hidden Wisdom of People Around You for Unexpected Breakthroughs in Leadership and Life. So, okay, so we're going we're gonna to ask a whole bunch of questions here, Jeff, and you've been doing these and you get asked questions, but why is asking so underrated that it needed a book? Well, we often don't even think there is a need to ask the question because we're so certain about the way the world is. And I think we are especially certain these days. We've got lots of pressures around us that, that quell our curiosity. But what we don't realize is that there actually is so much more that we could be finding out from the people around us than we typically find out. The premise of the book is that we are surrounded by people, whether that's our bosses or our managers or the people we manage or our clients or our customers, or our friends or loved ones, who all are filled with ideas, insights, stories, perspectives, feedback 
that if we could actually tap into it, we would both be better off. We would make better decisions together. We would collaborate better. We would avoid mistakes. We would save time. We would be closer. But far too often, and I've seen this in so many cases, they just don't tell us. And that's partly because we don't ask. It is fascinating when you when you put it that way, because it is so true that we we do make assumptions about what people, what we know and, and what people have to share. So what do we get wrong most of the time about asking? Do, do, is it, is, are there certain tendencies that we have? Or, or you probably have a whole book about that that we could probably reference. Go to. <laughs> <laughs> do you mean when we're trying to ask the question, Ex what yeah, goes exactly. wrong? Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So some of it is that we ask questions that I do call them crummy questions in the book. Um, sometimes they're questions that are actually intended to learn something, but they are just clumsy. Mm. So we might, for example, ask three questions layered on top of each other, a triple barrel question. And people then don't know which one am I supposed to ask? Or if they respond, yes, you don't know which one they're actually asking to. Or we might ask a question and then state our opinion. And then are they reacting to our opinion or our question? So that we, one way we get it wrong is by being clumsy in our questions. Another way we get it wrong is by actually what I call being sneaky in our questions. When we're actually disguising our own statements as questions. Mm. Um, have you ever thought about seeing a therapist as an example? <laughs> um, or just, you know, using those questions to try to gently maneuver somebody almost the way that a lawyer would kind of lead the witness to a certain conclusion. And then sometimes we use questions to attack people as well. What the hell were you thinking as an example? Yeah. And all yeah. of those are ways that we go wrong. But I would say the biggest way that we go wrong is we don't even realize we need to ask the question in the first place. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you, I think it was early in the book, you talked about Nick Epley at the University of Chicago. Um, yes. We've had Nick as a guest. He was His research is fantastic about overestimating our ability to predict what people are thinking. Um, yes. Yeah. What, what's the story here? Like, why is it, do you think that we do that? I think it's the way that we're wired. I mean, Nick, Nick Epley... I think is the is the master of this phenomenon and the research on this phenomenon. Um, in one of his his studies, he cites a, a Maris poll of Americans um, and, and asked the poll asked Americans if you could have any superpower you would want in the world, what superpower would you want? And the top two superpowers that got named were time travel and reading other people's minds. <laughs> um, and yet, as you know, as Nick documents and in such a rigorous way. We're bad at it. And even the best advice that we tend to follow, put yourself in their shoes. That doesn't work. Try to read their body language. That doesn't right. work. I mean, even, even for, even for close, close relatives, like, you know, spouses and partners, we, you know, barely better than chance. Guess what people are thinking about? And so, you know, his conclusion, as I'm sure he told you from being on your show, is that there's literally only one way to read someone's mind, which is to ask them the question. Yeah. That's the only reliable way to do it. And yet we're never trained on how to ask questions. And, and, with that, so so Jeff, help me understand. Do do we we if if we know that like hey, we want to have mind reading as one of these superpowers, and we know that we should be doing that. Do we think that we're actually better than we are though? Do we think so? In other words, do I believe that I can read my my wife's body language and I know what she's thinking when when she gives me that look? Is that and. And in reality, that's what the, the research yeah. says. Exactly. Okay. That we that we believe we can do it and that and that we're overconfident relative to the accuracy of our ability to actually read people's minds. Yeah. But getting back to the the quality of questions, how we ask makes a difference. Yes. Right. As you were saying, there's a variety of different things that we can do that are kind of crummy. But what do you what are the things that we can do to make questions good? Yeah. I think the first thing I would say is something that is a step or two back even from what is the question that we design, which is where's the question coming from? Mm. Um, is the question coming from a place of genuine curiosity or not? Um, because a question that is just stated in a formulaic way or we're, you know, we're asking because we think we're supposed to be asking or we're going through the motions, people can tell. Um, it does not come off as authentic and that can shut people down. Conversely, if we're deeply curious, if we're genuinely wanting to know, that alone radiates an energy that makes people want to share more with us. Um, and so, you know, in the book, we talk about this, um, you know, th this methodology called the ask approach. Mm -hmm. And the first step of the ask approach is choosing curiosity. And we can, we can go deeper on that if you want. But I, I think the first thing I would say is it's got to be about where the question comes from. 
Yeah, it's really interesting. We had uh, a guest on Kwame Christian who talked about, um, and he's a negotiator, and he was talking about in negotiation, the first step is being compassionately curious, right? It, yes. It, it, yes. And, and I like the, the the combination of those because it is what you're saying is this curiosity is this first part. We have to be really curious. And he added the compassion on, but let's dig into the curiosity part. What What is it about curiosity that leads to the the, the better outcome for the questions? Yeah. Well, it's interestingly, if you look at the Latin root of the word curious, it actually is the same root as the word care. Um, and so if we are truly being curious, I think we are, we are being compassionate. Um, and I talk about a particular type of curiosity that I think really matters for this, which I call connective curiosity. Um, so it's not just, you know, the curiosity about Russian history or curiosity I have about the tree or curious curiosity about my own, you know, life story. It's, it's curiosity that actually connects me, which means that I'm curious about the experiences of someone else, the feelings of someone else, what they know, what they think, et cetera. Um, and that kind of curiosity um, cultivates in the other person a desire to fulfill that curiosity because they feel cared about. They feel um, that we genuinely take an interest in them. And I would say um, it's actually rare, and I think it's become more rare in our society to, to receive that kind of curiosity. Um, and so when we offer that kind of curiosity to somebody else, it is a gift. It's an acknowledgement. It's a validation of them. And that creates a, a desire to, to connect back as well. Yeah, this need for certainty seems to be uh, almost poisonous uh, in, yes. in our world today. Uh, and I, I, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking through the polarization issues that we have politically uh, and the uh, the desire to stand on one side of the line or the other and to identify and be positive and be and be uh, certain about about all that kind of stuff. And to be curious kind of says I'm a little bit of a loser because I'm not 100 percent sure in, in our world today. It is a countercultural move to choose curiosity. Yeah. Um, when we're surrounded by people who are telling us, you know, you should believe X, Y, Z, wherever you fall on the political spectrum or any number of an issue, or when you're a leader in an organization mm. and you can internalize society's messages that say, if you say, I don't know, that can be a sign of weakness, um, to step out and actually say, I'm really curious and I want to know what you think about that. I, I agree with you. It can go against the grain. Yeah, uh, let's let's dig into the ask approach. Uh, yeah. I, I, there's there's uh, what five steps exactly. Uh, it, it might be worth uh, just kind of highlighting uh, some, some some of those, or or, or just kind of walk us through the, uh, the the ask approach. Yeah, I'll go through it at a very high level, and then we can dig in if if Great. if that makes sense. The first step, as we were talking about, is choosing curiosity, and choosing curiosity is really about centering one question in our minds when we're engaging with someone else, which is simply. What can I learn from this person? Um, if we've got that question in our minds, everything else flows from there. Um, and we can talk about how to get that question in our minds, but that's, that's choosing curiosity. The second thing is called make it safe. And this is a recognition that even if I'm curious to learn something from you, if you don't actually feel safe to tell it to me, maybe because you think I'm going to judge you or it's going to harm our relationship um, or it's going to expose your own incompetence or any, any number of different things like that, you're not going to tell me. Um, so that so making it safe is all about making other people feel at ease and interested and making it appealing for them to actually share with us their truths, especially hard truths. Yeah. Third is posing quality questions. And so we've distinguished earlier the, the, the difference between a crummy question and a quality question. I define a quality question very simply as a question that helps you learn something important from the other person. Um, and so just the same way that a surgeon could reach for very precise tools for this move or that move in a surgery, we can actually train ourselves on the repertoire of questions that we can be using depending on what we're trying to learn from someone else. And so we can talk about a whole taxonomy of different kinds of questions that help us learn particular things from the other person. But once you pose a question, whether or not you learn from someone depends entirely on how well you listen to what they actually say. <laughs> and right. we all think we're better listeners than we are. But there is a big difference between listening and hearing. Um, and so this step is called listen to learn. And it's really about how do we take in what is the, you know, what is really at the essence of what someone is trying to convey to us, including what they're not saying as well. And then finally, and I think to me, this is my favorite and the most important of the five steps. Once we listen, if we are actually going to grow and learn and take action from it, we have to process what they're saying um, and, so, and make meaning of it. Uh, and so this step is called reflect and reconnect. And this is all about how do we actually take it in? 
how do we sift out what is valuable from what is not necessary to, to be processing? And then how do we turn it? And I talk about three important reflective turns to really squeeze the most amount of insight out of it. But it's not enough to just take that insight away ourselves. We've got to go back and reconnect with the other person and say to them, here's what I got. And thank you. And did I get it right? And is there something more I should be taking it away? And that has an enormous impact on the other person. It, you know, it, it lets them know they didn't waste their time. It lets them know how much you value them. It gives them the chance to correct, but it also radically increases the chance that they're going to want to share with you again. No. Oh. Because they see how important it was to you. Why is, uh, why is reflect and reconnect your favorite? I am a nerd and a junkie about learning. Um, any, anything, any learning opportunity, I it just lights me up. And honestly, any missed learning opportunity for me is, is a micro tragedy. And so if we've gone through these wow. four steps and we've actually, you know, have it right in front of us, but we don't take the time to squeeze the meaning out of it, you know, what a missed opportunity. And I think it's so possible to do if we go through these reflective steps. Yeah, I'd, I'd like to dig into a couple of these because I think they're fantastic. Um, the, the first is that it's this make it safe. And, and you note in the book that 85% of people withhold important information from their bosses and about half simply feel uncomfortable speaking up in general. And, and actually some, what, what else did you say? 60 to 80% of Americans withhold information from their doctors. Can you believe that? I, it's, information that literally would benefit their own health. <laughs> yes. yes. They're not, it could be life or death. So, and they're not saying because they think their doctor might judge them. Yes. And so, so help us. Yeah, we how, all how do, do it. How do we yeah. do, how do we make it safe for people? How, what, what, what can we do in order to make it so that if I'm a doctor or if I'm a, a, a boss in, in, in my company, or even if I'm just a peer in my company and I, I want people to, to you know, feel safe talking to me, what do I need to do? Yeah, so there's three important strategies to bear in mind. The first one is being very intentional about where and how we connect with the other person um, and to do it on their terms and on uh, ideally on their turf okay. as well. Um, and so, as you may have seen in the book, I interviewed some iconic CEOs, um, and CEOs are notorious for not really getting all the information from people, but I interviewed people like Bill George from Medtronic, um, or Irene Rosenfeld from Kraft, and they both went out of their way to say that in order to make it safe, they have to be very choiceful about where they're in interacting with someone. So Irene would talk about, I'm having lunch in the in their cafeteria, not in some kind of executive you know, lunchroom. I'm going to, uh, on ride-alongs with salespeople in their car to see what they see. Bill George said, if I, if I ever want to get the truth from someone, I am not going to sit, make them sit across the big executive desk from me. <laughs> you know, we're going to be sitting side by side on a comfortable couch. So a lot of it is that in my own personal experience, you know, I have a teenage daughter and she, uh, when she gets home from school and I'm, I want to know how her day was and what, you know, what happened and all that. I ask her, how was your day? What did you learn? What happened? Zero, nothing. <laughs> I get absolutely nothing. But if I, if I follow her lead and I, and I go to her room at 11 p.m. at night when she's done talking to her friends and she's done with her homework and that's when she, you know, she wants to talk forever. Yeah. Um, and I get all, I'm, I'm exhausted. <laughs> but if I want to actually learn, part of making it safe is doing it when she wants to do it and where she wants to do it as opposed to where I want to do it. Wow. Okay. So that's the first piece is, is where is, you know, really connecting on their terms and their terms. Um, the second is I got to open up too. So that means if I'm asking them to open up, I go first. Opening up, that could be just opening up about why I'm asking the question. So I'm not just posing the question without, because people might have to, might be guessing my agenda, but I, I want to make my agenda completely transparent. Or it may also mean opening up about something that is vulnerable for me to share as well, which invites reciprocity. And then the third one, um, which I think is most overlooked, uh, is what I call radiating resilience. And that's really letting the other person know, I can be resilient if you tell me something hard. That means I'm not going to crumble. Um, I might get upset or I might have a reaction, but if I have a reaction, I'm not going to hold you responsible for my reaction. I'm going to take responsibility. And so if I demonstrate that kind of resilience, which can be as simple as saying things like, if I were in your shoes, I, I, would, I imagine I'd be incredibly frustrated. Um, what's, you know, what's going on for you? That's a simple way to let them know like, okay, if I tell him I'm frustrated, he's not going to, you know, he's not going to, you know, jump on me or react, crumble or whatever. Cause he just told me he imagines I'd be frustrated. That's one way to do it. I have a, um, I have an investor in my own organization who, who radiated resilience by saying to me, you know, I'm assuming that once I make an investment in someone, it doesn't go as planned. <laughs> and so what I'm interested in is how does it not, how is it not going as planned with you? 
all of a sudden she's told me that she's resilient <laughs> to letting me know that if I tell her things are going off the rails, that's a normal thing yeah. um, as well. I, I love that aspect of creating the, the, the fear, making the fear and taking the fear and saying, normalizing it, basically saying it. No, exactly. I, I anticipate that you're frustrated. I, I, I know that things are going to go off the rail. So I want to understand that now, because if I don't, that's going to lead to, to bigger issues in, in the future. Yeah. And if I do, we'll be better off together. Yeah, that's great. So how do you moderate your, let, let's say uh, you ask a question and the person comes back and they give you an answer and their answer causes you heart palpitating anxiety <laughs> because yeah. it was not what you wanted to hear. How do you moderate that? So some of it is if you're really trying to learn from the other person, you do have to monitor your own reactions. That doesn't mean faking it, but that does mean taking a deep breath, noticing that this might be coming up for you, but that it's inside of you, not blaming them for causing that reaction to you. Um, I, in the book, I interviewed another CEO, Chung Hao Fu, who talks about anytime someone's bringing him news or feedback, he just really pays attention to his facial expressions and tries to continue to have a receptive facial expression um, when people are sharing things with him. And again, that's not faking it or, or pretending he's not having a reaction, but he knows how important it is. And there's lots, you know, there, there's research in psychology in terms of parenting that if parents, you know, have a massive reactivity when their kids are telling them something, that puts up a huge barrier. And so parents also need to think about, um, you know, we're, we're going through the college admission process with my son right now, who's a senior. We're right in the thick of it. And my, I, my wife and I keep saying, whatever he tells us, if he gets in, if he doesn't go in, don't have a massive reaction. <laughs> Just stay calm as well, because that's going to make it more likely that he's going to feel safe telling us things. Oh, yeah. I, I'm going through the same thing. So I, it's really interesting because I, I, I love this idea of like understanding how your reaction is. And you talked about the leaders specifically. And we've had, yeah. we've had guests on before who talk about leaders get more attention. And so is this even more important if you are a somebody who is leading people or leading an organization? Do you have to be even more conscious about how you're responding than say, if it's you and me just having a casual conversation, um, asking questions about each other? I mean, I think, yeah, I think, it applies everywhere, but I do agree that leaders have more eyeballs on them. Leaders have more formal authority. And with that formal authority can come fear as well. And so leaders are more insulated from really hearing what needs to happen. I know I've had that in my own leadership experience where I have missed out on really important things because I didn't make it safe uh, with people as well. But I will say, I think this it also really applies to somebody who is in the more junior position with their manager. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times managers, and I, I, I have been guilty of this myself at times, don't give all the feedback. Right. Um, and sometimes that's, be, and, and that really hurts somebody who's in a more junior position because they are, they, they don't perform as well. They don't have the chance to learn and grow. And so I think it's actually equally important for the person in the junior position to be making it safe for the manager to say, I need and want to hear what you have to say. Whatever it is, I want to hear it as well. Yeah. And I know even with people who work for me, um, sometimes I'm, in a, I'm just in a rush and I do have thoughts and feedback and observations, but I'm just rushing from one thing to the next. But if they say, Jeff, what is one thing I could have done better? Um, all of a sudden that tells me they want to hear it, makes it safe for me and it pauses me and I'm far more likely to contribute to their growth and development. So, so there are a couple things there, right? So one is that as a junior person, you can actually help in that process by asking That's questions right. like you just said. And then as you were talking about, you, you give a really good story at the beginning of the book too, about one of the, like, you know, first managerial kind of position and you had this feedback and you just were leaving. And then you asked the person at the end about how they, how they reacted, how they felt to this. And it was different than what you had anticipated. Exactly. You want to talk about that story a little bit? Yeah. 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 And I think it's a perfect example um, of one of the kinds of questions inside of step three of post quality questions, yeah. which is a, a question, a, a strategy that I call request reactions. Um, and so often we just say our view or we give someone input or guidance or whatever. And we assume, well, if they disagree, they're going to tell me, or, you know, if they, if they have an issue with it, I'll find out. But they're thinking, 
they must not be interested in my view. Um, <laughs> and so they don't sell right. us. But right. if we simply, you know, so, so in this particular story that you were talking about, I was, you know, I was giving guidance um, to, you know, to, to one of the people that I was a new manager of. I thought I had just given him, you know, some very clear, helpful direction. <laughs> he was going to run, you know, and, but I said, I had just been trained to ask this question. What's your reaction to that? And it, you know, when you first start posing new questions, it can feel a little stilted or awkward or, but I just said, I'm going to push through that. I'm just going to ask the question. All of a sudden, he said to me, I found myself completely deflated by what you just told me. Um, and I thought to myself, thank God I asked that question because, you know, I wasn't happy to know that he was deflated, but I was, he was going to be deflated whether I knew it or not. Yeah. And so right. I'm going to, at least now I know about it. Then we could debrief what was the miscommunication that we had. We cleared it up. We got on the same page and things worked better. And so this question of what's your reaction to what I just said? How did that land with you? What might I be missing? What am I overlooking? Is there a downside to what I you know, just said? Any, any version of that request reactions, I think is one of the most um, overlooked strategies that we can use to really learn what's going on for somebody else. We can think of lots of experiences that we've had in our life. I, well, let me say this. I can think of lots of experiences that I've had in my life where asking a question yielded information that I was completely not anticipating. Mm -hmm. It brought new light. And you tell a story about uh, an Uber driver. Yes. And that I found just riveting. Uh, mm -hmm. I think I think Kurt's on the same page there because it uh, it actually happened in Minneapolis. So can you tell us a little bit about that and how uh, uh, and how asking some basically getting beyond your own assumptions changed the dynamic dramatically. Yeah. I so saw I had just spent a week actually in the boundary waters of of Minnesota. Beautiful, um, beautiful area. Well, you know, yeah, on that's a, awesome. a wilderness trip with a set of very close friends that you know we get together every summer. And um you know we had just spent a week really you know asking each other questions and sharing each other's lives and and I was you know walk coming off of that trip I was you know just reminded of how how, how much there is to everyone's story and all that. And so I was on my way to the, you know, Minneapolis airport, uh, the Uber pulls up and on the, you know, on the bumper sticker of the Uber is a flag of the symbol of the thin blue line. Um, and then I look at the driver and he's wearing a hat and it has that same flag as well. Um, and in the circles that I have run in, that flag is a symbol of a values clash. It's a symbol of um, things that, you know, lots and lots of people that I, you know, that I, that I hang out with would say is anything from insensitive to scary to racist to, you know, a whole number of different kinds of things. And so I, and I look at this and I think to myself, oh, my God, I'm going to get in a car with somebody who has all these things that, you know, that, that my community would say is, is the case. And, and honestly, a little bit afraid for my own safety as well as a Jewish person, because there's some associations with that, too. And, I, and my immediate instinct is to just take out my phone and start catch, catching up on my emails. Yeah. But <laughs> I, and that's, of course, the safest thing to do. Totally. Um, totally. Yeah. Uh, but I thought to myself, you know what, I, I just remind I just spent a week, you know, reminding myself that you can learn a lot from other people. And there's a lot that's going on for people. And so I just said to the person, you know, can you tell me about, you know, what's your experience? What's with the, you know, what's with the hat? What, you know, what's behind it? Are you, you know, are you part of the police force? And, you know, there was a lot of traffic, thankfully, because we actually got to have a very long conversation. And what I learned was an incredible story of this person's own life themselves as a, as a former police officer, their fiance as a former police officer, their cousin who actually very sadly was murdered by a gang in LA their time as a corrections officer confronting people that they had arrested, but also their deep belief in dignity um, and in treating people with dignity and in community policing. And even when arresting someone, often giving them, you know, one more cigarette before they go to jail, you know, go into jail, all these kinds of things, a truly compassionate person. Um, and, and I, and I said, well, you know, what do you think about defunding the police and, and, and the call for that? And I, I got a very receptive answer. So you know, that's an interesting you know, position, but what would happen if, you know, their house got broken into? Who would they want to call? You know, and so I, I got, I really just got a 360 degree, very textured understanding of someone that all I had originally do it, did, done was just write them off um, as a fly. And I actually walked away feeling grateful that we have people in our country who are serving and, you know, and protecting communities with the kinds of mindsets and attitude that this particular person had, humbled that I was making some of the wrong assumptions connected to this person. Um, I didn't walk away saying, all right, I'm going to, you know, buy a hat like that for myself. But boy, did I, did, did I learn a lot? And, and did I, and did I, you know, feel a lot closer to, to someone who otherwise seemed as, as 
you know, the other. And and I think you, you bring up a really interesting perspective in this, the, the idea that we make those assumptions based on surface kind of attributes about, all right, exactly. I'm judging that person as an individual because I see something, they're wearing a certain type of clothing, they're having a certain bumper sticker on their car, et cetera. So what can we do? Because just like you, I mean, my initial response would have been probably looking down at my phone, you know, and, and being safe about that as opposed to posing the question, are, are we doing too much of that as a society, do you think? I mean, is there a way that we can ask people and, and have these conversations to understand them better? And is that something that we should be doing? I believe it is. I mean, I think what you just said is a perfect uh, illustration of how we get stuck in what I call the certainty loop where we see a tiny little slice of information, we select that out of many possible things that we could be paying attention to, and we select that through the filters of our own pre, you know, pre-existing assumptions, and all of a sudden we just race all the way up to conclusions. Those conclusions reconfirm our initial assumptions, and we get this sense of here we go again. And we don't even know that we're doing because the whole thing happens in split seconds, and so it doesn't even occur to us that there is any other way that this person could be or that life could be, etc. And so that's how we stay certain. There are some ways to interrupt that. and. Uh, there are, you know, in that chapter on choosing curiosity, I talk about curiosity questions that we can inject. So first of all, if we can notice that we're doing that, we can ask ourselves, what other information might be going on in this situation? Maybe this person is also a brother or a father, um, or maybe this person, you know, it has some other thing that I can connect to, etc. But also asking ourselves, what's another way to interpret what I'm seeing right now. It doesn't have to be the story I'm telling myself, the other kinds of story. Uh, there can be other kinds of stories. We can be saying to ourselves, how can we use the emotional reactions that we're having, which often shut down curiosity, as a cue to remind ourselves, all right, if I'm feeling really triggered, that's a moment I need to get curious. Mm. Um, and so rather than just giving into our emotions, it can actually be saying, let's use the emotion to remind ourselves that this is a moment to get curious as well. And then we can enlist other people in our lives to help us see who, what, you know, who, Whose voice is not being heard right here? How can I actually surround myself with some other people who will provoke me out of my bubble and to be thinking about different different ways of looking at a situation? I love the way that you express this idea that when you feel triggered, that's a signal to get curious. How yes. do you do it? How do you, or, or maybe you just never get triggered. So I get maybe. triggered all the time. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't even apply. I wouldn't be human if I, if I didn't. <laughs> right. So how do you deal with it? How do you, how do you make that, whoa, wait a minute. I can feel it welling up in me. I'm going to do something different. Yeah, I'll 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 sort of say my enlightened way and my um, my mere mortal way as well. <laughs> great, um, great. Let's let's yeah, let's hear because both. I will probably yeah. associate with the mere mortal way a lot more. <laughs> the enlightened way is actually just you know starting to train yourself to notice it, um, and so that you know in all the ways that I think, especially in recent years, we have we have come to understand how mindfulness can help us separate stimulus from reaction and and give ourselves a pause to inject a question mark in there, and rather than just you know acting on our anger is to say, oh, I'm noticing that I'm angry. Now that's a reminder to do that kind of thing. And that does take some work and practice and whether journaling or therapy or coaching or um, meditation, there's a whole bunch of different modalities for how we can do that. The mere mortal way is to get a friend to help. Um, <laughs> and so, uh, you know, I have, uh, I, I'm very, th very lucky in my job to have a co-CEO um, in, you know, in my organization. And when I kind of race up to, you know, my own judgmental certainty about why did this person who works on our team not do this and that, et cetera, my partner, Elon, will say, hey, you know, you seem a little worked up about this. Yeah. <laughs> is, is there another way to look at the situation uh, right now? And, you know, the, I think curiosity, um, I've learned this from a mentor of mine, Phil MacArthur, curiosity is a team sport. Um, if we want to get curious, we don't have to do it all by ourselves. We can enlist our friends and colleagues and partners to help us get curious. And if we invite them to actually do that, it makes it easier for them to just say, yeah, here's one of those moments. I think you're worked up now. What could you be curious? How could you be more curious? I'm really interested, Jeff, because you talked about your co, you, you know, um, um, CEO, right? As you're as you're doing this, and so in a work situation, I would I would assume, and this is an assumption, right? Because again, I'm trying to to model some of this that that being curious at work is probably a, a positive thing. So, is, is this something that in work situations? Uh, our listeners should be trying to instill and get their co their peers that are working with them to maybe form a curiosity circle or some sort of way of, of, of building this? 
A hundred percent. There's, there's a number of different things that can, you know, that teams and organizations can do to build curiosity into the workplace. Yep. Um, you know, in my, in, in the very first place that I worked literally hired for curiosity. Um, and so at the end, I didn't know this at the time, but at the end of our job interview, after like five or six different people we were interviewing with and panels and performance tasks or whatever, what they did is they had someone give us critical feedback. Um, and as candidates, we didn't know that this was you know part of the whole routine. And so I got a whole bunch of critical feedback. And my initial reaction is, I guess I didn't get the job and they're <laughs> being nice enough to tell me. Um, but what they were really doing was to see, am I curious about that feedback? Do I ask them to, you know, to tell me more, to learn more, or do I get defensive about that feedback? So some of it is we can actually engineer the culture by who we bring in and screening for that kind of curiosity. Um, but there are also other practices, like in my current organization, we do something called two by twos, which is that every quarter, anybody who works closely together um, is, gives each other two pieces of positive feedback and two pieces of critical feedback, and also shares two self-reflections of positive feedback and critical feedback. Oh. And that kind of builds in natural curiosity because I'm like, I, I now want to know what's your two by two for me. And they want to know what's your two by two for me, et cetera. And it just kind of clears the air of anything that might be building up and normalizes that kind of, you know, we're going to be asking questions of each other and learning from each other. There's a part of the book where you talk about nine tips uh, on how to tell people, you know, how, how to tell if you're really getting the, the right message here. And one of the things, and, and some are, are pretty intuitive, you know, like listen, you know, ditch the distractions. These these are great. But the eighth tip is back off to move forward. And I love that you, first of all, that you kind of have this perspective. And can you talk about that one? At least, that was at least one of my favorites, but maybe you could also talk about one of your favorites. Great. Um, I'll talk about I'll talk about that one and then I'll, I'll jump to one more. Um, that one is a recognition that even if we want to learn from someone, that doesn't mean that we have the right to continue to grill them as an inquisitor until we get what we want. And in fact, it's important to respect their boundaries. And and sometimes people are not yet ready to share what it is that we need to hear or want to hear. And so if we're asking them questions or a follow-up question and we you know, get the message from them that that's enough, and, and, and you can test that explicitly by saying, you know, if you want to stop, that's completely fine. If there's more you want to share, I'd be interested to hear that. But if you get that, you know, that's all I got or I'm ready to stop. It's important both as a, you know, ethical and respectful thing to do. But I often find that later someone will come back and say, you know, I'm ready to talk about that now. Um, I find that especially true with my kids, but also true with, you know, people in the workplace as well. One of, one of my other favorite ones, actually, I'll just say two favorite ones because I just think they're so powerful. One of them is called paraphrase and test. Yeah. And this is just, you know, so overlooked, um, but it's it's the simplest thing to say. Let me paraphrase what I think I heard you say. Did I get it right? Um, it does so much. It slows down everybody in the conversation, so we can all take a breath and have a chance to think. Invariably, I have missed something when I paraphrase it and check it. It sends the message to the other person. I care enough to know if I got it right, and that creates a signal of value. But it also invites the other person to to, to keep going and say more. So that's I think that's you know that's just such a concrete and easy thing to do. And then the other one I would just say is just this qu pulling the thread, just the, just pulling the thread and saying, what else? Is there more? Can you say more about that? Because so often the most important thing that ha someone has to say is not the first thing that they say. But if we stop at the first thing they say, and then we move on to the next topic or the next question, we've literally missed it. You know, there's a term that clinical psychologists have for this, which is called the doorknob moment. You know, they'll have like 48 minutes of a psychology set of a therapy session. The person's walking out the door about to, you know, about to, to hold the doorknob. And then the most important thing comes out. Um, and, you know, then they say, I'm leaving my wife or, you know, this and that. I'm getting investigated by the government. Um, but it's, you know, it, it, it's not it's not the first, second, third or, you know, 10th thing that they've said that really matters. And I, I often find that in work, you know, when I'll say to people, you know, what do you think we should do? Whatever, and then, and then they'll tell me, and I'll say, and what else? Yeah. Um, and is there more? And is there, you know, and say, and you know, and, I'm, and I'll say, you know, you know, when you're done, feel free to stop. But I'm going to keep asking you, is there more until you tell me that's it? And and it's like the last idea is, is often the most creative idea of all. Um, and so I find that a really valuable um, technique as well for listening. Oh man, that that is just absolutely fascinating because too often in my, in, I've seen this happen. Right? Is is that you don't do that. The, the the paraphrase and you don't ask what else and you just go on you just move forward through what's going on and it comes up like a month later or a week later right. or right. at some other point where all of a sudden it's like why didn't you 
tell me about this, you know, when we had the conversation last week and well, you never asked. And so, or I thought we talked about this. Well, no, I thought we talked about this again, as, uh, as we talked about at the beginning, behavioral grooves, right? The, the name, um, the, Tim and I agreed on, we had two very different versions of it. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's very because interesting. Because we, because we didn't ask. We didn't ask. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And that is a, I love that story. I'll never forget that story. And that's, that also speaks to another, you know, question strategy in post quality questions, which I call simply clear up confusion. Um, and that's just literally, you know, asking the other person, what do you mean when you say that word? What do you mean when you say groups? Yeah. What do you mean when you say we should grow into this market? <laughs> Any number of things. It's incredible how often we define things differently than somebody else. And just by pausing and saying, how are we each defining this term? Somebody on my team recently said, can we just make a glossary of our key terms for this organization? Because that way we'll know we're using them in the same way. And it, it was a very productive exercise because it revealed that we were actually thinking about some things in a different in different ways from each other. Well, and, and, and corporate speak is so amazingly just, uh, again, it, it's so obtuse. And so the, yes. the, the ability to interpret it in multitude of ways. Yeah. So let, I, I love the idea of creating something like that. My last question, I know Tim is itching to get to music here, but my last question, as podcasters, Tim and I are asking questions all of the time. And you talk about posing, you know, you know, good questions, right? If there was one uh, helpful hint that you could give us as we are crafting our questions, this whole li big line of questions that we have, what would that one hint or tip be for us? I love, I, first of all, I appreciate that question. I think that's a great example of a question that's called, that I call invite ideas. Okay. Um, you're, you know, you're essentially inviting me to share an idea. And I think, you know, having been through this podcast now, I love the questions that you asked. So I'd, I'm not sure I would throw in new questions, but I think I would probably, you know, point you to the listening um, and say, once somebody answers that question, maybe give them a chance to say, and is there more? Um, and is there something else? Um, and is this the right thing we should be taking away from what you, from what you just said? Um, because I think that will invite more things out of people. What else do you have to say about that? Well, <laughs> exactly. Well done. <laughs> well played. I, I'm, I'm being sarcastic, right? But, but at the same time, Jeff, thank you. Thank you for that feedback. We relish it. Let's just, let's just put it that way. In the section, we, we were talking about tips. And in that section, um, you make this comparison about listening to music for the, for the first time. And yes. you said, you know, that, that there's this lovely analogy of that the, that the unskilled ear basically kind of uh, hears just all the instruments and all the sounds at the same time. And it's all just kind of jumbled. But to the skilled ear, they start going, well, this is what the bass is doing. This is what the drums are doing. This is what the keyboards are doing. Things, things like that. Um, do you think that in general, we're listening to conversations with generally unskilled ears? To, yes. to, to, to I do. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm a recreational musician at best, a, a campfire guitarist or whatever. But when I take the time to actually listen for the percussion and the bass and the vocal, etc., I enjoy a piece of music so much more because I can really appreciate each of those different dimensions and then appreciate how they come together. And the same is true when we're listening to people. And so in that chapter on listening to learn, I talk about three lenses or three channels to listen through. One of them is content. So what are the words? What are the, what, what are the messages? What's the data? What's the information that the person is conveying? That's where, that's where I naturally default to. And I think where a lot of us are, you know, if we get any training and listening, it's listening to the content. The second is listening for emotion. What are the feelings that are being conveyed? Um, and we might hear that through tone um, or through body language, et cetera. And, you know, Per our conversation earlier with Nick Epley, we shouldn't assume that we got that right, but it's something we can be listening for and then checking and testing with the other person. Um, and then the third is action. What's the person actually doing? Maybe they are repeating themselves. Maybe they are coming back to the first point that they made. Maybe they're asking lots of questions. Maybe they're speaking indirectly. Maybe they're making lots of requests of us. Those are all different examples of behaviors or actions that they, that they can, that they're taking that we can be listening for or observing in a conversation. And so, Typically, we either listen through one channel or, as you, you know, as you said, Tim, it just jumbles together. But we can actually train ourselves to listen through each of those different channels and then ask ourselves, what's the relationship between the three? Is there congruence between the words that someone is saying, the actions that they're taking, the, you know, the, the emotion? If not, that's interesting. How can we listen, you know, inquire into that as well? And we get just dramatically more information where we can train ourselves to listen through those three channels and then put them back together. 
You also gave the example of uh, Rick Rubin, uh, the great producer, uh, and talking about how he suspends judgment. Uh, and I was, I was curious if you've had that experience yourself. Have you, have, have you been in a position? It just felt, for some reason, as I was reading, it just felt like a very personal kind of a comment. Yeah, I mean, I think as as a fellow human being, I am, you know, I, I I'm a judgment making machine. Um, I constantly am rushing to judgment. There was a recent situation, literally in the last couple of weeks, where we had somebody on our team who was considering leaving the organization. Um, and my co-founder and I worked really hard to try to you know, help him see why it could be good for him to stay and why good for the organization to stay. And we wrote him some long notes and things like that. And then we got absolutely nothing back. You know, days and days went by. And I, that was a time when I had to, you know, I had all kinds of feelings that were kind of bubbling up. Why is this person not responding? What's going to happen, et cetera. And I just had to say to myself, you know what? It could be anything. Just suspend the judgment stay open, don't judge this person for their reaction or lack of reaction in this case, and and stay curious. And as a result, I felt I was much more receptive to getting back what, what, you know, what we ultimately got back. And ultimately, the person just said, I was really just processing it. I was reading it and rereading it and thinking through what you had to say. Um, and it wasn't any of the other things that, you know, <laughs> we were rushing to judgment about. Um, and it's, it, it, it's not easy to do that. But I do think when I can get myself into that space, um, I'm calmer too. Because curiosity can kind of compete with with anxiety and kind of push that anxiety out of the way. I love that. Uh, okay, let you've been preparing for this, so we want to know if you've got a year to yourself on a desert island. What two musical artists catalogs are you going to take with you? Oh well, first I thought you were going to ask me if I was going to you know wanted to hang out on that desert island with my favorite actor or not, <laughs> uh, and I was debating because I really have two I have two compelling answers, but you know I'm so compelled well, by by either one of those possibilities. Well, we've got to hear that. What's 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 well, your what's my actor your... would be Jason Sudeikis because Ted Lasso is my curiosity hero, um, and uh, I think there's so much on that show that we can learn about how to lead through 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 curiosity as well. In fact, on my I've I've written a, a trilogy of of blog posts about what Ted Lasso can teach us about question asking and learning, which is on my blog. But the, I've I've just such respect for you know for what we can learn. But I I also just love music. I, I constantly have music on in my life, and I and it was hard to pick. But I I came down to Paul Simon and the Indigo Girls. Oh, um, that I would uh, that. that I would take with me. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's a fantastic combination. Why why Paul Simon and why the Indigo Girls? I mean, the, so the Indigo Girls have just been, are something that my wife and I really share in common. Um, she loves them as well. You know, we do lots of, I play the guitar, we sing together. She used to be in an acapella group. And so she, oh. her song in the acapella group was Galileo. Okay. And oh, one of my favorite things to do is to play the guitar and have my wife sing Galileo. But, you know, they also have a song whose title is um, All That We Let In. And I considered... Uh, I considered um, actually having that as the opening kind of quote for the book because the, the the verse, the lyric goes, we're better off for all that we let in. Mm -hmm. And I just think in many ways that sums up the message of the book as well. Yeah. Oh, well, we could talk for hours about being campfire guitarists. Uh, I've always considered myself a living room guitarist first, actually. Uh -huh. uh, campfire guitarist second, but uh, certainly uh, had my rounds around there. But that that's fantastic. Okay, so... You've got two artists that you would definitely take with you, uh, the two musical uh, artists that you would take with you. If you had a third, who who might go along? Who else? What else? Uh, yes. see what then we start to go into some of the more like, you know, indie. Um, so I, I was I was um, thinking about Joe Crookston. I don't know if you know who Joe Crookston is. Um, he is an you know, amazing singer songwriter. Um, he's got a song uh, called Georgia. Um, and uh there's a verse in the song that says, Georgia, I'm here. And then it goes on to say, it's a broken and cruel and a beautiful world. Um, and he yeah. just kind of repeats that, that kind of um, chorus throughout the song. And I also think that there's just deep wisdom in, you know, in, in that way of being able to see all, all aspects of the world uh, as well. And I would probably also take Dave Carter and Tracy Grammer. I don't know if you know them or not, but they, you know, the amazing kind of folk singers as well. They they have a song called "Gentle Arms of Eden," um, and my daughter's name is Eden, and so we love we love singing that together as a family as well. Jeff, it is such a pleasure to have you as a guest on Behavioral Groups. We we hope you'll come back. Thank you. I really enjoyed this conversation um, very much.
Welcome to our grooving session where Tim and I share ideas on what we learned from our discussion with Jeff, have a free flowing conversation and groove on whatever else comes into our questionable brains. Oh, yeah. You thought I was going to say something different, I didn't did. you? I did. I did. You know, I did too until I actually just came <laughs> out of my mouth. Like, you know, that's usually how I work. But the yeah, so that's okay. unconscious at work there. <laughs> well, asking is about questions, right? Questionable mind. You got to ask questions when you're asking. Right? Yeah. Yeah. That's that's really the basis of of, I think, what we talked about with Jeff. It's this idea that you know, we have to be, as we talked about, we have to be compassionately curious and you have to yeah. ask questions. Yeah, yeah. It, it was a great conversation. I mean, I really, really enjoyed talking with Jeff. Really, it wasn't just like, oh, it was kind of fun. It was one of those really lovely learning in, you know, sessions too. Just the way he frames things is just really thoughtful. So, this is uh, uh, all right. We're, we're going to talk inside baseball here. Apologize, listeners, but I am super excited to talk with the big names that we get on on the podcast. Yeah. Right? Those are the ones we get excited about. You know, it's like, oh my gosh, we talked to a Nobel laureate. We get to talk to you know this researcher who I've uh, you know Zimbardo, who like when uh, you know is like all these crazy people that are just fantastic. But we also get to talk to these people who. I had never heard of Jeff before this. Right. Not that that's, I, I, I probably should have, but that's yeah. that's beside the point, but I haven't. But man, the insights that we get from many of our guests that are just well beyond anything that I would guess, it's just amazing to me. It's like we get to talk to these really bright people yeah. that, we would have never, never had the opportunity without this podcast. Yeah. That, that, done. Check. Yep. <laughs> that, that is Because yeah. if we called up Jeff Wetzler and said, hey, Jeff, we just read your book. Would you mind spending an hour just talking with us? You know, I know. Like, wouldn't it be fun just to have a little conversation about your book? He'd be like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm really busy. Bye. <laughs> but then you add you i'm amazed that they don't do that anyway <laughs> right. but then oh, who are you <laughs> behavioral grooves is that that music and behavioral science podcast no thanks <laughs> bye click click um but when you when you say no we're gonna record it for a podcast it's like sure I'm like oh this is fantastic <laughs> i know it's it's great and i and so hopefully listeners hopefully sorry about the inside baseball there but um Hopefully you get the the benefit of us being able to talk to these people. That's right. And, that's that's and the idea. Hopefully we have yeah. good enough conversations for you and that we ask the right questions Ooh. that you would have asked. Oh, there you okay. Go. Okay, so where do you want to start this grooving session? That's a good question, Tim. I, I think <laughs> I'm you... asking. I'm, I'm asking. <laughs> so this is the, so the key piece on this. If if I, for me, the the takeaway from the book and from this conversation, couple different things. The most reliable way to know what is on someone else's mind is what, Tim? How, how what? How do we? How do we do that? To survey them. To, and to, to put them through to a look uh, at their facial expressions to see if they're the yeah. micro expressions to understand are they are they feeling happy or sad? No, no, no. It's, it's understand their birth order. Oh, oh, or, <laughs> I yeah. Well, I, I I thought it was their their sign. You know, oh, yeah, are they right. Sagittarius? Are you Capricorn? What are you? Well, and is you it know, is it like a Western sign? Is it your Western zodiac or your Ayurvedic? zodiac that you rely on okay yeah. so you just threw that? a whole new i have no idea even what a vedic yeah because they're, zodiac they're sign different is. so which one do you rely on Boy. see i learned something i learned something with you every time i talk no it's you have to ask oh, them oh that's it ask. you just ask them okay. what's on their mind various different pieces and i think it's really the problem is that we don't ask yeah. right we yeah. assume and we don't ask yeah yeah, uh, because because why? Because we want to look smart, because we think we already know what's on somebody else's mind. And Nick Epley's work does a great job of pointing this out about, you know, I, you and I, I think both of us got engaged with Nick's work because of the, the, the commuter study on how your day goes after you talk to a stranger on the train. And 
it's fantastic. It's it's really just a fantastic thing to get engaged with someone who we don't know, who we don't know what's on their mind. And to simply ask can be a really rewarding thing for us, not just informational, not just in, improving the amount of information that we have for decision making, but it can actually just make us feel better. Yeah. And so for listeners, we talked with Nick Epley back in episode 287. Yeah. Wow. And so, um, you know, we talked about that study when and it's uh, why talking to strangers is actually good for your well-being. So fantastic. Yeah. And, and I think the interesting piece, as you said, it's like, why don't we ask people, yeah. right? It's like, we want to look smart and we think asking questions. We've been trained, rightly or wrongly, from from early childhood that asking questions about feelings and different things isn't always the easiest or best thing to do. And so it's hard. It's It's a very hard thing to just ask. And I think that's really an important aspect of of what you know Jeff is trying to say is we have to overcome that fear and we have to be able to just get out there and ask it's not as hard as we think it it is i think that there, that's a good point right that's a very good point yeah and this is a strange thing about the human condition is that we think it's going to be really difficult or that of course they're just wh whatever question we're asking someone that because we already know the answer it's just going to confirm what we already know. So why even ask? And we're missing out. I mean, uh, psychiatrics uh, have been known about this for a long time, that just, just asking the question allows us to talk about something in a way that might reveal some new information that we hadn't anticipated as the asker. You know, what's interesting, and, and we talked a little bit before this, is, you know, Obviously, there's the time of we have to ask other people the questions, but there's also this part I think that is unsaid. And, and I apologize, Jeff, if this was later on in your book and I just passed over it. Uh, but we have to sometimes it's about providing the questions for people to ask. In other words, like I want to be asked questions. Right. right. And right. and nobody's asking them for me. Yeah. Right. <laughs> And yes. and of course, and I go, well, nobody's asking me these. Well, because, no, of course they're not. They don't know what I'm thinking. Right. They don't have that. They So, you know, it's like sometimes you have to ask somebody to ask you a question. Yeah. And this this kind of gets to uh, t two things for me. One is our our desire for certainty, right, that we have this natural tendency to prefer certainty rather than asking and finding out something that we don't know or oh. don't know how to deal with. Um, and we've we've covered certainty with some really great uh, guests. We talked we talked about certainty with Debbie Sutherland in episode 324. Nathan and Susanna Fur embracing oh. a like great, maybe like world famous conversation with uh, with Nathan and Susanna. And it's only because we had three of those conversations just to get know, to one just, episode yeah. <laughs> because yeah. the technical difficulties, uh, you know, ep but, yeah. episode 345. By, by the third time, yeah. we have a pretty good conversation. You know, maybe that's what we need to do with all of our guests. God, well, I, just, I wouldn't yeah. mind it, actually. I'd love yeah, to have actually, multiples. Go. But I, I think that uh, certainty is one of the things that we really can struggle with and this desire yeah. for certainty. Ari Kruglinski, I forget what episode he was in, um, yeah. but you know, another piece on that, Peter Atwater on how to map uh, to success if you let go of certainty. That was episode 366. So yeah, one of your favorites, Brian Lowry, right? Yeah, you know, yeah. So, the you the uh, psychologist turned philosopher. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you philosopher people, man. Yeah. You know, yeah, there you go. All right. All right. So obviously asking, I think, is a big part of what Jeff is trying to get at in different pieces. But I think there's an underlying piece, too. And this is we, we we've talked about this before is choose curiosity. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, his his Uber driver experience that that story is fantastic in the book. He covered it a little bit in our conversation and. It reminded me, <laughs> my, a personal story, Katie and I moved to Charlotte, you know, a, a year and a half ago, and uh, we're, we're new in the city and we're just trying to meet people. 
right? So uh, on a dog walk, I run into a guy a couple of times and say, hey, you know, he, is, his, he says his wife is an artist. Let's go out to dinner. So we meet up for dinner and Katie and I ask them questions for about an hour and a half while we're eating dinner. And they did not reciprocate in any way. And so after an hour and a half, I, I kind of looked at Katie and said, well, you know, let's let's just get the tab and and, and there and still nothing from them. And then I, I kind of glanced at my watch and say, well, look, we've got other things to do tonight. We're we're moving on. And they said, oh, that that's great. We should do this again. And, you know, we need to, to learn more about you guys. And I <laughs> thought, yeah, you, we just spent an hour and a half where you could have asked us one question about us. And they didn't. They missed a huge opportunity to learn about us. Yeah. Isn't that it's it's fascinating, right? When you get into those conversations and and people don't ask you yeah, questions. Yeah. What does that do? So the, we we have that fear, as we talked about, like asking questions makes us look stupid. But in those types of situations, not asking questions makes you look stupid. <laughs> actually, actually, you know, makes it so that we aren't uh, as likely to, you know, want to have another conversation with you. Yeah. That we as humans like to be asked about us, about how we're doing, yeah. what is our background, what do we like, what we don't like, all of those things. And I so again, I'm going back to the the Uber driver, right? And remember when yeah. we were in Pittsburgh and we had we were at I think Carnegie Mellon and we took the, yeah. the lift back to the hotel. And we, we met the jazz bass the, player, yeah. The jazz bass player who, w one of those fantastic conversations, yeah. you know, and I've had more than one of those in Uber or Lyfts. And it's always kind of interesting because I used to have those a lot more, it feels like, and this is probably me just projecting out on this, but I remember like, getting into those. And I'd always ask because, and it feels different in an Uber Lyft. It's like, oh, have you been doing this long? And then we get into conversation and various different things. And recently in my conversations, like I get into them and I, I'll ask and I don't get like the answers. Like obviously they're not re reciprocating. They're not, they're not responding. Mm, interesting. And then it just shuts me down and it's just not the same type of, of ride anymore. Well, anyway. it's because you're really just not that nice of a person. And, and they don't like you. <laughs> but that was before as well. Oh, so that uh, did changed. I just hide it better back then? I don't know. Oh, it's odd, isn't it? Uh, there yeah. might be a trend there. Um, yeah. Something that, that strikes me about the, well, there's actually, okay, so two little things about the, the curiosity thing. Jeff said that curiosity uh, has the same Latin root as care, which is cura. And I think that it's always kind of great to think about how our words come about and that when we think about curiosity, it's a form of care. Oh, my gosh. Is that cool? It's a That's form. A, it's a wonderful shift, right? So, again, I, I know people like get nervous about asking questions and different things. But when you think about it, you're just showing care. Yeah. It, you know? It's like emotion and motivation and uh, those two words share movare as a common Latin root, meaning meaning movement. E emotion is a movement. It's an action. And I think it's it's kind of cool that, 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 that we have that stuff. The, the other thing that I want to say is that Jeff said that if you feel triggered, that is a cue for curiosity. He mm. said, train yourself to notice it. Now, that is a really important thing because... I'm sure that none of our listeners ever get triggered by anything. They're super calm and relaxed. And I never do. I, <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. But as soon as I, it's, I just want to pay attention, I want to be aware of that. Because if I feel that sense of being triggered, that is the cue to get curious. Ask the question, why am I being triggered? What's going on here? It's a great little heuristic. Mm -hmm. All right. I feel triggered. What's going on? I need to figure this out. And the best way often is asking, right? And asking questions. So yeah. what else, Mr. Houlihan? I, there has to be some other really insightful thing that you came up with. <laughs> well, how about listening? How about the listening what? side of it? What, what, why would we ever want to listen? Come on. Because it's <laughs> wonderful and, and it's important. 
And la, 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 la. Oh, I'm sorry. Were you saying something? Well, uh, in, in doing a little digging, found a paper written by Paul Rankin in October of 1928 in, a, in an English <laughs> journal. Kind of. Okay, a little you trivial. Are amazing. You are freaking amazing. A 1928 article. Yeah, okay, yeah. Keep going on. About the importance of listening because the spoken word is used more than the written word to communicate. And so it kind of got me thinking, okay, 1928, I can imagine that the spoken word was more common than than the written word. But today, okay. you know, with screens and things like that, I I was a little I was a little concerned that, well, wait, maybe we're not so dominated by the by the spoken word today. Maybe we're dominated by the, the written word. So I found the Gong Research Labs in 2016 analyzed 20. <laughs> Is that from the Gong Show? No, that, no, <laughs> no. It's a legitimate. Gong. It's a legitimate research firm. Uh, okay. And but they analyzed 25,000 sales calls, and they said that the most most successful calls were the ones where the salespeople listened at least 50 percent, 57 percent of the time. So more than half, close to almost, you know, 60%. Yeah. Okay. Right. Right. So, so there may be, a, you know, there may be some shifts and, uh, and Gong published a whole bunch of really interesting little stats, you know, that share, share some of those with us. Well, yeah. there's a couple of ones. First of all, active listening is identified by 64% of HR professionals as the most critical leadership skill. I, how about that? That I actually, that's a really important and, and it, it aligns with my own personal experience working with leadership teams. I just, as we talked before this, just got back last night from a, right. a leadership offsite that um, I spent the week at. In Florida. Um, yeah. With Florida. <laughs> Wonderful Florida. Love Florida. And, but part of this was working with the leadership team of like, they're going through major transition. They have, they, there was a recently acquired merger acquisition right. and leadership now has new, new team members underneath them. And, you know, there's this initial push that is like, Oh, all the transition talk. And then it's like back to business as normal. And, and part of what we talked about is no, you still have to ask your employees how they're feeling <laughs> yeah. and you have to listen to what they're saying and what they're not saying right that's another big piece because as a leader you know they're gonna only tell you you know what they think you want to hear often right right not every time but often so these are and so these are listening th skills are, are important right yeah, yeah th this is like 15 high-ranking leaders from a fortune 100 company fortune 50 yeah. fortune 50 <laughs> company how would you assess this is uh since we're not naming the company uh, how would you assess their asking and listening skills average mm. at best mm, wow and, and again varies right within the individuals within there and, and, and this is a piece right with with leadership teams oftentimes you become a leader not always because you have great people or communication skills, but because you are an expert in your field. And that's how we promote within right. this. And so you have a subject matter expertise and you need to practice and learn these other skills. And as much as we would like to think that organizations, and particularly you know, larger organizations are adept at this and understand this. What I have found is that they don't, you know, is they often don't. They we we go about and uh, status quo of how it is. And they're just people are left to their own devices of being able to or a self-serve development. Right. Yeah. It's like you got to go out and search for these things as opposed to having that being helping them to, to do that. And yet a part of these factoids reveals that actively listening increases productivity and collaboration by up to 25%. Yeah. So that that's kind of a big deal. And so from that research that you pointed out, I'm looking at your notes, it says employee satisfaction has been shown to increase by 30% yeah. after managers go through training in active listening. Yeah. That 
that surprising, but it's in some sense and it's not in others. And it's just really crazy. So, yeah. yeah. And yet, <laughs> and yet 96% of people believe themselves to be good listeners. <laughs> wow. I'm, a, I'm, I'm in the top 10% of drivers as well. So, you know, there you go. Yeah. Oh, it, it is really interesting. And, and I think Jeff, you know, in, the wisdom that he had in kind of writing this book and in our conversation really points out that, hey, asking those questions is important, but we also have to listen to know what questions to ask. That's it. That it, it, In some ways, right, that's so simple. And, and the listeners are probably going, duh. <laughs> and that's that's OK, as long as we don't pass up the opportunity to act on it. Yeah. I think listeners are always going, duh, with our show, um, <laughs> at least when you and I are talking. So <laughs> there we go. How about we wrap this up? Okay. What do you say? There's a lot more that we could talk about. A lot more questions we could ask each other, probably, aren't, aren't there? <laughs> <laughs> I, you are correct. I could listen to you forever and just kind of, you know, make all these questions would come into my brain. But we need to close out this conversation. So groovers can go on to other conversations and ask and listen to other. <laughs> okay. I, 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 I agree with that. And we hope that you'll take away some of Jeff's tips and put them to use this week. Yeah, there are so many ways we can improve the richness of our life experience, but we can, can't do that all, um, all day, every day. So just pick one, maybe one day this week and choose to listen with curiosity, have some compassionate curiosity, as Kwame Christian says, a bit more than you have in the recent past. Yeah. Let's do that this week. I like that. I like that. I'm, I'm with you. I'm going to, I'm going to give that a try. Um, Kurt. So thanks. Thanks for that encouragement. And, and with that groovers, we hope that you take this tall drink of curiosity and listening skills, of course, and use it this week to help you go out and find your groove. <laughs>